How are we this morning? It is good to be with you today. I am excited about today, and what a time of worship we've had so far, and I believe it's getting gooder and gooder. Yes, yes I do. Yes, I said that right. I coined that phrase myself uh, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit where I messed up. I'm, 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 I'm for real. And if you're joining online, um, I, I've told the story before. Welcome. <laughs> it's good to see you-ish. And uh, we're so glad you're tuning in. I believe God's got a message for you today. And um, even if in circumstances or situations you messed up or screwed up, God can redeem and work and move and restore. And, and um, we believe in, the, in, in God's power to do something miraculous in our lives. And I believe it's not by accident that you're here today. We're in the middle of a series called To the Future. And we're talking about what God is getting ready to do in our lives at a, as a church. Um, and uh, I have been praying for this message and preparing for this message. And um, this morning when I woke up, um, I got really angry because um, all of my notes and my slides for this week um, we're on a laptop that died. And I'm, oh, I, and usually I have a backup, so I went down to the office to pull up the backup, and that did not translate over from that, um, from my laptop to uh, the other device. Um, so this is a leaning on the Holy Spirit moment, and, um, and I, I just want to encourage you for this. So you may um, remember first service. It may little be a little bit different for the second service. And I'm just going to go with it as my wife, influenced by the Holy Spirit, lovingly encouraged me as I came up on the stage this morning. Just go with it. So <laughs> I love that. She's amazing. My wife, Courtney, is amazing. And I love doing life with her. We have been married over 18 years. She is amazing. Yes. All right, I, um, as I was in worship uh, through that incredible song, Waymaker, and just watching, wa letting that wash over me, I was reminded of something I was diving into this morning in my own personal devotions, and I, I just caught a glimpse of something quick that I'll share with you. Um, our, our vision here as a church is to connect people to an authentic and life-giving relationship with Jesus, making fully devoted followers of Christ. That means Jesus will change your life. He's changed my life. I know he can change yours, and when you have a real, authentic relationship, I'm talking about real, real. I'm talking like you really know him and he really knows you. Not just you know about him and you sing about him and you, you read about him or you heard about him, but you've had an encounter with him and he actually changes your life. There's something that transforms you and something that's life-giving, something that makes life come alive. I mean, you can live life but not really live. And I, I, I believe that you can be fully alive and you can have that experience with God because he created you, he loves you, he created you for a purpose, and he did, didn't just didn't call you to live according uh, to to your will, but to his, because he has a perfect will, a perfect plan for you, perfect plan to live out your life, and as you align your life with him, it gets gooder and gooder, <laughs> okay, and and I, I believe that more can happen through the purpose and destiny bigger than you can think or imagine, and I believe God's setting you up for something. Something happened in the life of the disciples in John chapter 12. I'll read it really quickly. Um, something stood out to me um, in this message. It's ver um, John 12, starting at verse 25. The person who loves his life and pampers himself will miss true life. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. <laughs> The person who loves his life and pampers himself, gets himself an iPhone, gets himself all the diddly-doos, and gets himself all the, the, the 401ks, and masses his wealth in his own kingdom, starts making his own, his own significance, his own priority. His, the person that pampers himself will miss true life. Just ask Elon Musk. Some of you read the article. That he gave his heart to Jesus. And I don't really know. I'm not his creator or maker, but I pray that he has. You'll miss true life. But the one who detaches his life from this world. Whoop. Listen. This is, this is how we get a, an authentic, life-giving relationship with Jesus. And then the follow-on statement to that is now we just we want you to have a life-giving, transforming relationship with Jesus and connect, connect you to that. But we want you to mature as a fully devoted follower of Christ. Not as a half-hearted follower of Christ. Not as a semi-devoted follower of Christ. Not as an occasionally devoted follower of Christ. But a fully all-in, all-committed, all-you devoted follower of Christ. And in order to be able to do that, you've got to detach yourself from this world and abandons himself, not 
abandons himself, like empties himself as some other religions teach. Yes, some other religions teach you empty yourself, you empty your thoughts out, you empty yourself. There's a, there's a process where God calls you to empty, to, 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 to be empty, to abandon himself to me, to your creator, to your maker, to, to, to the, 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 the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to walk on this earth, you need the Holy Spirit to go to anywhere you want to go. Okay, just make sure we're on the same page. If you want to be my disciple, this is where Jesus is talking. And he's talking to this, his disciples. He's talking to this crowd. This is John chapter 2. This is after Lazarus, 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 Lazarus was raised from the dead. And there's a whole lot of things going on in, this, in, in his life. And he's sharing with the disciples these moments. And he says, if you want to be my disciples. He'd already asked them, hey, come follow me. But he's like really checking their heart. He's really, he's really like, it's a gut check now. He's really going after it. No, if you really want this now. I mean, I asked you before, and we had some fun stuff. We had some highs and lows. We saw, we saw people, like, healed and set free and delivered and food multiply and all kinds of cool stuff. And you got to go preach and do some fun stuff. It was fun. But now, like, are you ready to actually be my disciple? And I think that's what part of the Lord is asking us right now. Like, if church has been fun, we could have a motivational service, and we could sing and chant and yell and scream, but when the tough gets, when things get tough, and things get, there's trials and suffering and things happen, when I've called you to be radically obedient, like give up that job, or give up this thing that you so dearly want to hold on to, or, or give up that dream so you can actually follow my dreams for you. Hello. Come on. If you want to be my disciple, follow me, and you will go wherever I am going. Where's the direction of the church going? Wherever Jesus tells us to go. The whole motto, I live my life this way. The whole way I want you to live your life. Listen to Jesus and do what he says. Where are we going as a church? Wherever Jesus tells us. And if you... If you truly follow me as my disciple, the Father will shower his favor upon your life. Whoo! We're not talking like little trinkets or little bonuses or little things that kind of make your life more cushy or pleasurable. You will have favor from God. What did favor look like in the Old Testament? It looked like Water where there was none. Looked like food where there was none. It, didn't look, it, it looked like relationships flourishing. It looked like healthy life. It looked like life actually beginning to ble beam. It looked like God's face was towards people, meaning he began to speak to them and begin to have a personal relationship with you. That happens even in a greater way as we, have, are, on, as we are on this side of the cross and what Jesus did for us. Even though I'm torn within, this is Jesus saying, even though I'm torn within and, and so, my soul is in turmoil, I will, not, I, I will not ask the Father to rescue me from this hour of trial, for I have come to fulfill my purpose, to offer myself to God. So, Father, bring glory to your name. Then suddenly, listen, a booming voice was heard from the sky. I kind of miss this at times when I'm reading this. A booming voice. I have glorified my name, and I will glorify it through you again. The audible voice of God startled the crowd standing nearby. Some thought it was only thunder, yet others said it was an angel spoke to him. Then Jesus told him, the voice you heard was not for my benefit, but for yours to help you believe. From this moment on, everything in this world is about to change, for the ruler of this dark world will be overthrown. And I will do this when I'm lifted up off the ground and as I draw hearts of people to gather them to me. I want to pause right there. I think Jesus is asking us a deeper question this year. Are we ready to be a disciple? Are we truly wanting to follow after Jesus? Is that really what he has called us to do? Are we really wanting to do that? Are we really wanting to give our hearts to Jesus?
I don't believe that it is our responsibility alone to build the church. In fact, I think it's God's responsibility. Just like it's not our responsibilities to fight our battles, it's God's responsibility. He takes that on for him. Now, he calls us to be obedient. He calls us to follow after him. He calls us to pursue him. In fact, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 27, it says, The Lord Almighty, God of Israel, you have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build a house for you. So your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Here David is crying out to God, and, and he's experiencing God's favor and his blessing, and he wants to build a house for God. He wants to build a temple. And it's the longing of David's life. And so he gets everything ready for the temple to be built. So the Lord says when, his, when it's his time to, to pass on, he says, nope, you can't build the temple because your hands are blood or have blood on them, but your son can. So he begins to get everything ready for the temple because this is in David's heart. And Solomon builds the temple. And what was really in David's heart is that this house of God would be a place of prayer, a place of communion, a place for God to inhabit, to, a place for God to, 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 to be comfortable and to live in. And the amazing thing that what, what was Jesus was talking about in Scripture was that thing, everything was about to change, was that no longer would you be ruled by the, the God of this world, the God in this world, and occasionally be able to have an encounter with the living God. But that you can have a every day, all the time encounter with God because of the work of the cross that tore the veil and opened a relationship to be restored between you and your Heavenly Father. As I began praying about this, this season, this time, this year for us, I got a word, and the word was mobilize. As I began thinking about that word and praying about that word, it spoke volumes to me, but I realized it may not mean a whole hill of beans to a lot of people out there. I don't even know what mobilize means. When I began to hear that word mobilize, I knew that it was, that the definition to me was prepare for a movement. I believe God's calling us as a church to prepare for a movement. To prepare for a move of God, prepare for the body of Christ to begin to move, to, to prepare for uh, an advancement of the kingdom of God. And I think this year isn't just a building year, isn't just a preparation year, but it's an activation year in which the body of Christ needs begins to stand up. As I began praying about this, this message and God's favor and grace on our lives, I was brought back to the story of Gideon. In Judges chapter 7, Gideon is, a, is an Old Testament figure, character who was, who was um, a judge. And this was in a time when the nation of Israel had its own, uh, had lived in the promised land, but they didn't have a king as a unifying leader over the nation. They had judges that helped to rule or disseminate the, the rule of law uh, in, in the nation of Israel. And God was their king. This is what God was trying to establish for this nation of Israel. And then it was eventually the nation of Israel cried out because all the other nations around them had kings and they wanted a king because they felt left out. Um, and so they, they went through that process to get a king. His name was Saul, then David, and the lineage went on. But Gideon was a judge. And many of the judges in those days had military uh, responsibilities because they, the nation of Israel kept getting attacked. Now, I said this first service, I felt, feel led to say it again this service. If you are constantly feeling under attack, let me remind you to submit to the proper lordship and kingship in your life. The way God had intended the nation of Israel to thrive was that he would be king. The way that God has intended you to thrive is for him to be your king, to rule your life. That means you surrender to his will and his way. As I began reading this, I, I noticed 
uh, a couple things in this story of Gideon. The nation of Israel was, uh, had activated uh, th thousands of troops to prepare for an army or a battle against the army of uh, Midian, the Midianites. They were all in, in this valley together and preparing for war. And the Lord spoke to Gideon and said, hey, you've got too many soldiers. You need to like whittle that down. And Gideon's like, uh, what? God says, yeah, anybody who's chicken, anybody who's scared, tell them to go home. You don't need them. Okay, all right, all right, okay. Um, as somebody who's had military experience, I've been in combat. I understand what that means. I understand how you can have fear. You're getting ready to go to combat. I, and, and you really need people in combat that are accountable, trustworthy, can, can, can lead the way, can make difficult decisions, and, and have courage. So, okay, I get, I get it. God knew what he was talking about. I get it, I get it. Uh, they need to go away. So he sends them away. And that's like 22,000 people, Scripture says. Go away. <laughs> and then God comes back to Gideon. He says, uh, Gideon, that's still too many. I want to show that I am, it's me who does the work in this, not the people who are fighting. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to send the people down, the army, down to the water. And any of them that, like, kneel down and put their face in the water and start drinking it like a dog, they're in one group. And the others that kneel down and put their hand in the water and bring it up to their mouth are in another. And so as the, as the remaining troops go down to the water, there is only 300 that kneel down and put their hand in the water and bring it up to their mouth. And God says, I want them. I want them. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to prepare them to go against the, the, uh, the Midianites. But I want you to take the trumpets that everybody left as you sent them back to their tents and, and their provisions. So you're not picking up their extra swords and their ammunition or anything else that they have to fight. I want you to pick up their lunches and their trumpets wait, you got 300 against the field full that's like, there's, Scripture talks about it being fuller than the sand on the beach, <sighs> full of enemy in front of you. Almost feels like they're surrounded. <laughs> and then God challenges Gideon. He said, if you're afraid, go down to the camp and listen to what I'm about to do. And as Gideon gave them instructions, take your trumpets and your, uh, and your torches in your hand and then blow them. We're going to strategically do this, 100 on each side, and blow them and shout through the trumpets and, and give a big shout. And we'll see what the Lord does. And so, in verse 20 of chapter 7, the three companies blew the trumpets and smashed jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets that they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. As soon as I began to hear this, my spirit quickened to something that I felt like God called us to do this year. Two things, to, to lean in on prayer and unity. That as 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 like Gideon and the, and, the, and the 300 that were there, they, they, they recognized that there was a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon, that there was something specifically happening in there. And while each man held his positions around the camp, all the Midianites ran crying out as they fled. This is how God began to position the nation of Israel, his people, against the physical enemies. And, he over, and God overcame the enemy. And I want to tell you, God is still overcoming. He overcame the enemy. He's still in that, in that business. He still has done that. There was something in this process, something in this, in this that stood out to me in, in, in a way. As I began reading this scripture, and then I read 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, something began to resonate inside of me. It says this, and after you've suffered a little while, some of you feel like you've been suffering 
whether it's this this past year has been a, a year of suffering or 2020 and 2021 or the last four years or five years or ten years have been some suffering. It says, after you suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And that's what I felt like the, 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 the Lord is doing for here at Restore. For uh, several years, I felt like I kept saying that God's restoring Restore. And I feel like he is, he is, is continu- he's continuing restoring things, but he's also confirming some things for this body and strengthening things in this body in order to establish us. Another version puts it this way. And then after your brief suffering, the God of love and grace who has called you in to share in his eternal glory in Christ will personally and powerfully restore you and make you stronger than ever. Yes, he will firmly place you up and build you up. As I began seeing this verse and reading into this, it's the process that I have felt like God's called me and us as a church to help raise up disciples, to uncover, develop, and release disciples. We see this with the disciples themselves where Jesus began to uncover them, began to, to, to promote them and expose them. He said, come follow me. And he began to say, hey, you're not just a fisherman. You've called to more than that. He began to develop them and teach them and train them. And then he began to release them and give them ministry and authority and identity and purpose as disciples. I want to, with the few minutes remaining left, I felt like I wanted to encourage you with this. And I didn't have all my notes. I brought some of my notes that I had. I didn't have time to, um, to sort through and, and credit. Um, sometimes in my, in my sermon search and praying through, I read lots of other sermons to get ideas and, I, and concepts and connections that I perhaps don't on my own. This is a popular, a common way that pastors study, right? Not only do I read sermons, but I, um, I read commentaries and in the Word. And, and one of the sermons that I began reading, I, I, there was a couple concepts that stood out to me in, in the idea of mobilizing. Number one, envisioning. Help people see the possibilities for great contributions to Christ and to his kingdom through mobilization. Jesus communicated a passion for winning the lost sheep. Without a clear vision and purpose, people tend to drift into idleness and complacency and apathetic mediocrity. Informing, ask the Lord to help you gain greater wisdom, knowledge, insight in the best ways to inform people about the great ways to carry out God's vision and winning discipling. Sending people out for service. As I began, as I was praying through this, whether to share this or not, I wanted to just send these last few home to you. Encouraging. Paul said this. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify God the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To encourage someone literally means that you are infusing them with courage, to instill confidence, to stimulate them to be more encouraging than discouraging. Let's focus more on the good things than we do the problems that are in front of us. Equipping, Paul wrote, equipping the saints for the work of service for building up of the body. Provide whatever supplies or resources or spiritual inspiration that's necessary to help your people accomplish what the Lord is calling you to do. Utilize the whole range of spiritual gifts and talents in the body. And do not hesitate to call people in, uh, to call in people who may be specialists in areas who are weak within the body or, or, your, or your church. Empowering. Ask the Lord to infuse us with his power, might, and authority to accomplish everything related to his great commission. Paul prayed, strengthen with all power according to his glorious might for obtaining of all steadfastness and patience with joy. 
I felt like in this season that there's some empowering coming. There's some strengthening coming. There's some encouraging coming. There's some equipping coming. There's some, there are some instruction and inspiration coming. I feel like there are some things in this season, but God is coming back to the question, do you truly want to be my disciple? That means we listen to Jesus and do what he says. And I've told staff, I've told, talked to the leadership, we want to come alongside of you and support you in ways as you step out in faith and ministry. I, I, there are, there are, there are, as a church, we've come around kingdom builders and church planners. And I, I, <laughs> there are so many things in my heart and mind that I want to accomplish that I, I don't even want to take the time right now to list all of those things out. But I know that as we're faithful to answering that one question in this season, in this moment, am I ready to truly follow after Jesus? Do I want to give him what he paid for? He died for your whole life. And he wants to give you his resurrection in life. He wants to call out those things in you. He wants to raise those dead things that have been dormant inside of you back to life. Some of you don't even know your purpose. But if God wants to remind you of that, establish that in your life. And he wants to minister to you today. I'm going to ask you if you stand on your feet. I believe God's got a bright future for each one of us in this room and within the sound of my voice. If you're watching online, I believe God's spirit is there with you. He can minister to you right there. We're going to continue in a moment of worship together. And I, I just want to encourage you. I want to speak to you. If you need prayer for any reason, we want to pray for you. There'll be in this room, there'll be people stationed in different places to pray if you want prayer for any reason. And online, there's people praying for you as a staff. We gather together to pray. We also believe in the power of worshiping together and shouting for joy and, and, and exalting the King of kings and Lord of lords and what he's done in our life. And I believe that this morning you can sense the spirit. You can feel it in, in the air. You can feel it in the room. And you can feel it online. And I want to talk to those of you who may be far away from God right now. I believe God wants to do a work in your life. And if you just turn your heart over to him and say, God, help. I need you. Help me. Save me. I invite you to be Lord of my life. I'm not serving my own needs, my own wants. I'm, I want to serve you. You begin that relationship with Jesus. I think everything in your life is going to change. If you've given your heart to Jesus and you need some more refreshment and encouragement or building up, I believe now is a season. I want to pray over you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day and this time together. God, I pray that you would pour out your spirit in this moment. God, I pray that you would bring things to life. I pray that you begin to pour out your spirit on all flesh. I pray our sons and daughters would begin to prophesy. I pray old men would dream dreams and old women would begin to dream dreams. I pray that we begin to see an outpouring of your spirit in this place that is tangible, that can be felt. I pray that you begin to restore relationships, that you begin to restore marriages, you begin to restore the hearts to the, from the, of the mothers and fathers to the children and the children to, their, to the mothers and fathers. I pray that your word would come alive. I pray that you would be faithful to the things you called out. I thank you, God, for the work that you're doing. I thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit, the counselor, the guide, the, the, the friend, the, the power, the empowerer. God, I pray this morning right now, if anybody needs a touch from heaven, God, I pray that you pour out your spirit. I pray that you begin to call, bring things to life again inside of us. God, I thank you for your resurrection power that rose Jesus from the dead that dwells in us. And I pray that this morning you will receive our worship and our praise in Jesus name. Let's continue to lift up the Lord in worship this morning.